You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm your host, Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, April 20th. We're sharing local news and resources, focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. The show airs live at noon on Tuesdays and Fridays and repeats at 5 p.m. both days and at noon on Sundays. And you can also listen online anytime at kdrt.org. My guests today are Rachel McKinney, CEO of Sutter Davis Hospital, and David Lichtenhan, chair of the YOLO Interfaith Immigration Network. And we'll get to our first interview in just a few minutes. Earth Day is tomorrow, April 22nd, and our friends at Climate Strike Davis are organizing an Earth Day Sing Out. Davis musicians are urged to consider creating a short video singing a favorite earthy song. Upload to YouTube and tag with hashtag Earth Day Sing Out Davis. And tomorrow you can tune in right here, 95.7 FM, or stream at kdrt.org between 5 and 6 p.m. to hear Davis sing. Thank you to DMA and KDIRT staffer Diane Crumley for her assistance with that project. The Yellow Healthy Aging Alliance is now accepting senior participants to receive calls and volunteers to make calls during this period of sheltering in place. The Alliance will then watch these, match these phone friends for daily social check-ins. Seniors will be matched with volunteers from the same community, and along with socializing, the volunteers will also help ensure that their friend has the food and medicine they need. Yolo Healthy Aging Alliance will also assist with connecting seniors to home delivery services for food and medication, and the Phone Friends for Seniors program will operate until the COVID-19 shelter-in-place guidance is lifted, maybe beyond if seniors have an ongoing desire for the social connections that they'll be creating. You can learn more at yellowhealthyaging.org. And here's a family fun opportunity. Help Me Grow Yolo County offers family dance parties via Zoom every Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. Families can join in, get some wiggles out, and move their bodies under the direction of a licensed physical therapist. Help Me Grow Yolo County is a project of the Northern California Children's Therapy Center and receives funding from Yolo First Five and Yolo County Health and Human Services. And they have a, a very wide variety of resources for families. They can be reached at helpmegrowyolo.org. Hmm. And in somewhat sad news, but understandable, the city of Davis announced yesterday that it's canceled the annual city 4th of July festivities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Police Chief Darren Pytel noted that although the current shelter-in-place guidelines are very likely going to be over by the 4th of July, we have a lot of reason to expect there will be continuing restrictions on large events and crowds through summers. Please know that our city officials will, and police and fire departments will continuously monitor any guidance provided by the state and county uh, regarding these considerations over the coming months. And it may be that we'll find some way to do smaller gatherings, but as a community, we will not be out at Community Park this 4th. The city wants to acknowledge the Davis Live Music Collective for coordinating the music lineup each year and the Discovery Christian Church for signing on to create the Family Fun Field. And finally, the Davis Downtown Business Association and the City of Davis are launching the sponsored Gifting Stimulus Program tomorrow, April 22nd. Uh, We'll have more on that on Friday's show when their executive director, Brett Maraska, will be my guest. But the program aims to infuse $100,000 into its Davis Downtown member businesses The marketing campaign is designed to support businesses right now and in real time during the shutdown. So whether your business is closed, partially open, or fully operating during the shelter-in-place mandate, every business has the opportunity to benefit from this program, but you have to register. And we'll clarify whether that extends beyond downtown Davis or just the core area on Friday. You can learn more at Davis Downtown. Dot com. And let's take just a moment for music before our first call. Imagine, if you will, that you run a hospital and found yourself tasked with preparing all your staff for a pandemic. Most of us haven't lived that reality, but our first guest has. Rachel McKinney is CEO of Sutter Davis Hospital, and she joins us today. Welcome, Rachel. 
Thanks, Autumn. Thanks for having me. Um, we're, I'm really happy to hear your voice. Um, first, we've, we've all heard endless stories about how hospitals are faring and from PPE shortages down the line. So, so how is the staff at Sutter Davis doing? The staff has really been incredible. It's, it's really been an amazing opportunity and a very challenging and complex situation to see um, the level of expertise and compassion that this team brings every day to their job. Um, as you know, Sutter Health has a long history of caring for patients with complex illnesses, including infectious disease, and um, the team is, is really pulled together, um, supporting each other, supporting the safety of our, our patients, our mm -hmm. staff, the rest of our teammates, and um, I have to say I'm really proud of this team for the creativity and adaptability that they've demonstrated the last few months. Mm, I can imagine. So walk us through this a little bit, if you will. When, when did you first start to, to hear about COVID-19, and then how did you as a hospital begin to prepare for that? Well, I think like everyone else, um, you know, individually watching from afar with what was happening in China, and as a health system, we actually started tracking this, um, you know, in, in December and January. Mm -hmm. From a system perspective, we have outstanding support and leadership from our um, Sutter Health Emergency Management System, which we call SHEMS. And we actually stood up SHEMS um, in response to what was happening in China at the end of January. So mm -hmm. a lot of uh, pre-work before we really started to see cases um, in California. And um, that work really began and is built on our um, emergency preparedness work and safety work that we do all the time throughout the year to be prepared for any sort of an emergency and, and in this situation, a, a global pandemic. Um, so from a system perspective, it's been almost three months actually since mm. we've been preparing for this. And then I would say probably in uh, about middle of February when we first started to see some of the repatriation of patients uh, off some of the cruise ships and, and globally mm -hmm. that were coming into California. Um, really started to ramp up our efforts locally um, and activating our own local emergency management system at the hospital, um, right. bringing our teams together to reevaluate our existing policies around pandemic and epidemic preparedness, our infection control practices, um, pulling all the right folks together to, to make sure that we were ready for whatever might come our way. Right. I am. I imagine you're in near constant communication with um, with county health and California Public Health and the CDC. How Absolutely. does that work? Yeah. So uh, I have to say the the collaboration and the support that that we've seen from uh, the city, the county, uh, Yolo County, Dr. Chapman under his leadership, mm -hmm. um, the the constant communication, the updates that we receive uh, on a weekly basis with, with phone calls, uh, communications from California Department of Public Health on new updates and, and changes that might be coming from a state level. Um, our system is also very closely connected with the work that's happening at the state level, um, both through the California Hospital Association and work in collaboration with the Cal California Office of Emergency Services mm -hmm. under the governor's direction. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's one of the things that, you know, has been really eye-opening about this whole situation is really just the, the amount of information um, that has come our way and the amount of collaboration that so many stakeholders from across the state and nation have um, pulled together to really uh, make sure that everyone is as coordinated as possible in, in this type of a situation. So constant communication, um, constant updates. Um, we are on a lot of phone calls with the uh, you know, key policymakers and others that are helping to lead this effort both at the state and national level. It's a daunting amount of information. I, I kind of want to know if you have a situation room. <laughs> we do. Um, we do. And so that is under our um, local, what we call our command center. And um, that is uh, the boardroom that we use in the hospital mm -hmm. setting. And we have our daily briefings at 9 a.m. with what we've called COLT, COVID Operations Leadership Team. And that team meets every day at 9 a.m. And then um, any information that comes out either from the system or from the state or local officials, 
We evaluate throughout the day. We update our communications. And we have an afternoon call at 3 o'clock with all of our physicians and managers and other clinical leaders to keep them apprised of, of what's happening that day and new information or new policies or practices that have come out that we need to implement. So that uh, communication has been very consistent mm -hmm. daily. Our SHEMS team, um, as I said, has been working around the clock since the end of January 24-7. Yeah. Um, uh, they're man manning that situation room at the system level as well and uh, keeping us all informed of, of new information, whether that be from the CDC or the state or federal or, or um, others, and uh, making sure that we have the ability to implement that locally. Mm. That sounds intense. Now, in Yolo County, we we have had some losses and, you know, cases identified, but our, our numbers are not, thankfully, they're not where they are in other communities. Um, how, I guess I'm curious about the, how many patients have, have ended up at, at Sutter Davis. I know you can't disclose a lot of, you know, particulars, but that question and also how is the hospital protecting patients and caregivers right now? So I you know I think you, you commented about um, Yolo County and I think the public health office is the best so, uh, source of information for mm -hmm. that. They've uh, probably as you know and, and have other um, guests on your show have probably shared that they've really put together an amazing dashboard on their Health and Human Services website yeah. that is a real-time um, updated every day at 5 o'clock with the total number of cases, um, a breakdown by demographics, um, and so far to date there have been about 26 patients hospitalized um, in Yolo County, and mm -hmm. as you know there are two hospitals in Yolo County, right. um, and as you said, out of patient privacy, there's not much more mm -hmm. detail that I can go into. But from um, from an, uh, protecting our patients and caregivers, there's just been a tremendous amount that we've built on, again, from our, our standard work around infection control. Um, you know, we have um, obviously implemented and have maintained our protective practices around PPE um, in accordance with guidance from the CDC and, and our system leadership. We've also implemented other strategies such as um, universal masking um, for all staff and clinicians mm -hmm. as well as uh, patients now in the facility. Um, we've implemented temperature checks at all of our entries into the building to ensure that um, we're checking patient, uh, visitors, caregivers, vendors, anyone that's coming in the building. Um, we have limited visitors to the building as well, mm -hmm. um, which has certainly been challenging, you know, from a from a patient experience perspective. But we have been able to implement new technology to keep patients connected to their loved ones while they've been in the hospital, such as use of iPads and Skype and video conferencing mm -hmm. um, through FaceTime and other things to keep to keep them connected, but also still keep them safe. Um, uh, from the clinic setting or the, you know, the outpatient setting, we've really ramped up our video visits and our telehealth capabilities mm -hmm. um, to keep uh, our clinicians safe in the clinic by reduce, reducing the number of visitors coming to the clinics, but also ensuring that we can still provide that health care um, to patients that might not be urgent or emergent situations, but still have the ability to see their physician via mm -hmm. video visits. Right. Um, we have, again, as a part of our emergency preparedness, um, implemented strategies for grouping patients um, that might have COVID or might be un, um, evaluated for COVID in a certain location to make sure that we minimize the exposure um, to other patients as well as to caregivers, and then have actually set up our surge tent outside the hospital mm -hmm. in the event mm -hmm. that we do have a surge of respiratory illness patients we can uh, treat and uh, triage those folks in the tent um, without having to bring them into the emergency department. Um, so a lot of, of strategies, again, I think building on our um, experience treating, for, treating infectious disease patients um, as well as continuing to collaborate 
with the local and state and federal partners to ensure that we deploy those resources to mm-hmm. keep everybody safe. I'm glad you brought up the the issue about um, continuity of, of care because I, I've, I literally had someone say to me the other day, I think I need an x-ray, but the hospital is the last place I want to go right now. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm basically <laughs> afraid to go. And I, I think what you're, you're telling us is a, there's lots of ways to get information and possible, you know, diagnosis or at least advice using um, telemedicine, using, you know, services provided at a distance. And, and B, you've done everything humanly possible to make the hospital as safe as possible for the broadest number of people. Yeah, and that, that's actually one thing I'm glad you brought up because I really want to emphasize to the community that, that we are still here Um, We want to make sure people know that if you're having an emergent or urgent or concerning health situation that we don't want you to stay away. We want you to come um, and get the treatment that you need. Um, We have a website that we've set up and a uh, a toll-free line for both Sutter patients and non-Sutter patients that is available, but our website is a, a tremendous amount of information about um, what to look for, what should you do if you think you're sick, um, access to the telemedicine. We have a medical symptom checker on our SutterHealth.org website. Um, you can access the video visits. Um, and again, um, as the only emergency department in Davis, um, we want to make sure that people know that we are here, we're safe, we're taking um, as many precautions as are needed to keep our staff and our patients safe, even if you come for a non-COVID related illness. So um, really wanna make sure that the community knows that we're still here for you. Great, well you have given us a lens into something, as I said at the top of the interview, that most of us will never experience and, and gratefully so. And I wanna thank you for your work and for sharing some, I know you're a busy woman, so thank you for sharing some of your time today. Absolutely, thanks for having me. All right, take care. And uh, I, Rachel mentioned the the Yolo uh, County Yolo Public Health dashboard, which you can find. It's right on the front page at yolocounty.org. I've referred to it many times on this show, and um, and we have had a number of guests from the county talking about the county's efforts in in public health. Um, Speaking of countywide efforts, I, I want to remind listeners once again about the Yellow Community Foundation's partnership that was launched last week. Um, they're working with Yolo County and the cities of Davis, West Sacramento, Winters, and Woodland to create the new COVID-19 nonprofit relief initiative. Uh, these local jurisdictions are providing staff and funding to support the initiative's three components – a community-wide campaign to encourage direct contributions, a relief fund to provide direct grants, and uh, some technical assistance as well. Well, Yolo County's nonprofits, and folks, I, I am a person sitting here. I run a nonprofit. I can tell you we are all struggling with uh, greater demand resulting from COVID-19. It's, it's caused us to change up our services. We can't offer some things. We can't fulfill some things. It is stressful. Um, the, the fund uh, aims to present some funding opportunities critical for our survival. And, you know, it's just information about the activities and needs of Yolo County nonprofits and as well as links to the donation pages. There's a wealth of information there at Yolo cf.org that's for yellow community foundation and it uh there's there's a button for this whole COVID 19 relief project i think one more thing and then we're going to take a brief break for music before we come back with david lichtenhan of yellow interfaith immigration network and that is that if you haven't filled out your census yet you still have time. In fact, if you haven't filled it out yet, you're going to be getting mail. The government actually requires that you fill it out, so that's important. But more importantly than that, it helps bring resources to our region, our state, our county. Um, it's really important. It took me less than 10 minutes to fill out mine, so just just do it. All right, a little bit of music. We'll be back in a few. Well, if you're finding navigating information around COVID-19 difficult, imagine being an immigrant, far from loved ones, and perhaps unable to access information in your own language. Enter the YOLO Interfaith Immigration Network, also known as YIN. 
They're stepping up to help get some resources out to immigrants in our communities. And here to tell us more about their new project is YIN's board chair, David Lichtenhan. Welcome, David. Thank you, Autumn. It's great to be here. I really appreciate uh, being able to do this. You bet. Good to hear your voice. First, uh, let's tell our listeners just a little bit about YIN. Okay. We, um, YIN was uh, put together by a wonderful group of people back in 2008. Uh, before 2010, we became a full-fledged nonprofit, and uh, we've had many, many different um, uh, programs um, from uh, being in the juvenile hall uh, with um, with uh, ORR kids, which mm-hmm. was stopped uh, last year, and then uh, working with immigrants across Yolo County. That's what we serve, mm-hmm. and um, so so it's it's a lot of different uh, programs that we help the uh, kids in the migrant centers every summer. We may or may not be able to do it this summer because of the coronavirus, but sure. um, we're still trying. Yeah. Well, we're, we're here today to have you talk about a specific project. Before we do that, let me say two things. The first is that last week, Governor Gavin Newsom announced $125 million in disaster relief assistance um, to provide financial support to undocumented immigrants impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. But that's about $500 per individual or $1,000 per household. It, it's not a lot. The second is we're going to talk about your project, and I'm going to frame this as I always do. It, you are a nonprofit. You obviously need financial support for your project, but we don't do a direct ask for donations here on non-commercial radio. So we will refer everyone to your, your website. So now, now that I've said that, what is the, the project that you have developed, and tell us specifically how it's going to uh, impact immigrant families here in Yolo County? Sure, Autumn. Uh, well, I want to make sure that we uh, understand this is a community-wide project that started Anoush Dejoyan and mm-hmm. uh, many other great people and advocates uh, for our community uh, put this together. Uh, we um, got involved because we do service, uh, do serve and advocate for the undocumented. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've um, started this uh, with uh, focusing on paying rent hmm. and utilities because they're not eligible in general. These uh, The migrants who lose their jobs from the coronavirus um, can't, they don't get any kind of relief mm-hmm. from the state or the federal government other than what uh, Governor Newsom has uh, announced with the 500 per adult or 1,000 cap per household. So. Um, we are developing and have already implemented for two different families, paying their rent and utilities. Um, and um, it's, it's just wonderful to get feedback from them, how grateful they are. I've never met any family that wasn't grateful for our support. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really important. Part of, part of the issue is that generally people don't, raise their hand up and say, I'm undocumented. Well, they're afraid, um, right? There's a lot of fear. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, so we are wondering, in fact, how uh, these folks are going to actually get the $500 per person or $1,000 mm. per pa- family because mm-hmm. they're not going to raise their hand. Right. right. Now, with the resources that we have, beautiful people we have in the schools and um, with Emma Jackson and Hiram, um, we're getting families from mostly from the schools and then other families that we're associated or associated with already that have lost their jobs because of the virus, and we're starting to help them. It, it does take resources, and uh, it's, it's just something we have to do. This is a kind of a project that that is our sole program right now to mm-hmm. make sure that our folks get taken care of. All right, and this project is called, and help me with this, Apoyolo? Yeah, Apoyolo. Um, so uh, Apoyo is support, mm-hmm. and of course, our Yolo County. Right. Um, so support Yolo, uh, and this is supporting our families uh, that are immigrants and bought their jobs. So it's a, it's a uh, it's interesting 
combination of words, and we feel that it does resonate. We have actually uh, asked people that we know in the community uh, that are actually, we do know, that are undocumented, and they thought that that was a very significant uh, mm-hmm. uh, name for the program. So um, the, my understanding is that there's, in addition to financial support, there's other volunteer needs, other ways to get insol- involved. Or what are you specifically in need of or looking for? So we're look, looking for bilingual, uh, especially, uh, that can communicate with the families that we are connected with. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it's, it's especially when uh, they're uh, really afraid and, and we want to have those of us who can really connect, uh, be a part of this network that can talk with these people once we get their names and numbers, which mm-hmm. we have been, and find out what the real needs there are. And uh, uh, it's not just rent and utilities that we're focused on, but many other people are focusing on making sure they're food secure, that they have yeah. enough to eat, and um, other necessities of life. Uh, we had one member uh, out in the community uh, deliver toilet paper to one family because mm-hmm. they ran out yeah. and had no way to get more. So things like that. We're, lots of different uh, areas that we're looking for uh, support and then having volunteers come in. Um, and we do uh, do make sure that the volunteers are uh, caring and, and uh, can really think about wanting to support these folks. Yeah. So I know folks can get more information at yinyolo.org, and that's y double i n yolo dot org. The project itself is called Apa Yolo, and it's a capital A P O capital Y O L O. There's a sign up link at the at the Yin website, and um, let's give a shout out to the great Anush Jajorian you mentioned, who I believe is coordinating this project and does so much for our community. So I want to I want to thank you. Yeah. Absolutely right. Thank you. She has been great. Yeah. Thank I wa- you. I want to thank you for coming on and sharing the project, and um, I'll circle back with you at some point so we can find out how it's going. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank Thanks you, David. Have a great day. You Bye. too.